In celebration of Earth Month, we'd like to thank this month's sponsor, Big Pivot Partners. Big Pivot is an award-winning communications design firm with solutions ranging from sustainability and corporate responsibility projects like ESG, DEI, and TCFD reports to investor communications. As strategic consultants, they've earned a reputation for delivering strategic, creative solutions with hands-on project management that ensures projects deliver on time and within budget. Enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. This is Amanda Shea. Welcome back to ESG Decoded. And today I'm so happy to be having Rickard Nielsen from Esgaia on um, the podcast with me. Rickard is the head of stewardship success. Hi, how are you? Hi, Amanda. I'm well. Yeah, I'm good. Tell us a little bit more about the company and what you're doing. Of course. Um, so I've worked in the field of responsible investing for several years. And currently, I'm at a company called Eskaya. Uh, Eskaya is a software provider who provides institutional investors with an ESG engagement tracking software. So essentially, investors need in their active ownership and in their engagement with partly their portfolio holdings and other assets, they're engaging in dialogue and they're trying to influence the behavior of these companies. And so when they're doing that, they sort of need to think about how they are managing these dialogues and what kind of activities they, they are performing and how they are recording and tracking this information so that they can also share that in reporting to their clients. And historically, that's the sort of workflow that's been used via Excel. So most have used Excel for that. And essentially, we're then taking that workflow into a software instead, helping them improve around engagement management. And then primarily then we're talking about sort of three use cases. So activity recording, progress monitoring, and stakeholder reporting. So this helps them improve their engagement tracking. And hopefully in turn, it improves the overall quality of their their stewardship and engagement process and leads to better outcomes in the in the real world in turn. Let's break some of that down just a little bit for our listeners who may not be familiar with the investment process itself or maybe kind of these um, familiar with the investment landscape. When you're speaking about institutional investors, can you describe who's an institutional investor to begin with? Absolutely. So here we're talking about asset managers and asset owners. And when we say institutional, we mean these institutions, right? So the mutual fund companies that you have your savings via or the asset owners where your, where your, where your pension savings are allocated to, right? So these are the kind of entities we're, we're referring to when we say institutional investor. And then you mentioned there's different types of engagements that you're tracking as well. But tell me how that connects to the broader and kind of investment stewardship. Yeah, absolutely. Perhaps I'll, I'll sort of take a bit of a broader picture here as well. So if we start by talking about responsible investing, and, and I'll keep this short because I know that you've had a lo lot of great people on this podcast who've already addressed ESG well, investing. I want to hear your definition, your description too, so I think it's helpful for our listeners and for myself too, to keep on learning about what it can include, what it does include. So yeah, please absolutely. feel to... to Please be able to speak. Don't, don't hold back. <laughs> sure. So responsible investing is really sort of umbrella term for, for several different strategies. So when we talk about responsible investing, that actually sort of encompasses different strategies such as sectoral or, or norms-based screening, ESG integration, where you incorporate ESG factors into investment decision making. We've got best-in-class strategies or, or thematic investing as well as impact investing and investment stewardship. And on that latter piece of investment stewardship, then we're primarily talking about how you as an investors, investor use your shareholder rights and voice to influence the, the activities and, and performance of investees. So investees, we're talking about portfolio companies or, or other entities that, that you're invested in. So that's sort of the, the remit of what responsible investing is. and then. Investment stewardship, again, it's that ability to influence them using your, your rights and also your, your power and legitimacy as, a, as an owner in these companies. How are you seeing in institutional investors 
what's their theory of change or theory of impact through their engagement? How are you seeing that play out? Yeah, that's a good question. So when we talk about responsible investing in the theory of impact, so stewardship and engagement has a quite clear narrative there. We have empirical evidence that shows us that it can lead to both, both in increased returns. So saying that it's additional to, to alpha, um, we can see that it can lead to reduced risks. And of course, that it can lead to real world impacts or, or sustainability outcomes to the, these entities. So that's sort of the three pillars that we have um, that's really enforcing and empowering the, the role of investment stewardship as part of responsible investing. I would say that investment stewardship and engagement is probably together with impact investing, the foremost routes that you have to impact at the moment. Impact investing, of course, has a very clear narrative as well, whereby you essentially provide capital to projects or assets which really need that capital to, to introduce a, a new project. Right? So there it's really about providing capital to an asset that would otherwise be capital constrained. So they really need that extra capital to make something happen. And in comparison to some of these other strategies that I mentioned in the beginning, such as, for example, ESG integration, where it's more a model-based prediction, where we say that investors send sort of market signals through their investing behavior and, and thus by saying that we're trying to invest and, and account for ESG factors in investments and in that decision making, we will see improvements on the market as a whole. So that's sort of a, a different perspective in terms of what kind of evidence we have on the, uh, the link to impact in comparison to, to stewardship or impact investing. I think that's such an important distinction. I think there's a lot of confusion around the world <laughs> about uh, the different approaches as you described and how they are different and, in, and investors are applying, I guess, different approaches as, as required by their, their mandate. I exactly. wanted to clarify um, a word that you had used earlier. You talked about you know the potential for increased alpha. Can you tell us what alpha means on a... In layman's terms <laughs> absolutely so so essentially abnormal returns so extra okay. returns on top of, of you, you know the, the, okay. the, the standard what you would expect whatever right? so, the, if you're comparing against maybe an index or something like that like an s p whatever your returns are on top of the s p or index or something standard yeah exactly okay. it depends on what the benchmark is and sort of what the measuring stick is but okay. what we know is that what research tells us is that good investment stewardship and good ESG engagement that really works and where you have that right kind of balance of, of quality stewardship in combination with accountability, where actually you hold companies accountable for their behavior, for example, through voting and through, through dialogue and through potentially, you know, voicing concerns of, of exit from, from your investment and so forth. That's really when we see great legitimacy and power in this right and that's really when it can have that effect of, of being additive to your financial returns as well and i think that's a good reminder that it's not just voting i mean that's also yeah. you know that's always an, that's one of the channels let's say yeah. but there is engagement as well talking to each other and engaging there is voting and then of course there's the the ultimate investment decision or, or divestment decision at the end if you need to or whatever it is but there's multiple ways for investors to engage and we a lot of times focus on voting because it's very public mm -hmm. um, especially for mm -hmm. public companies and the results are published at the end and sometimes there's commentary yeah. or news coverage but equally important is that engagement throughout the year before you get to that vote yeah, exactly. I, and I, yeah, I'll just reiterate that because mm -hmm. voting is, of course, it's tied to your right as a shareholder, right? So that's your sort of the most, the, the ultimate way of you of exercising your, your ownership right on the, the company that you're owning, right? But when we talk about engagement, we're talking about a broader toolbox of different kinds of activities and interactions. And that includes partly dialogue and, and meetings with the companies, site visits, you know, signing public letters or, or expectation letters, participating on the AGMs and, and pre-AGM, you know, engaging with, with these firms and so forth. So 
engagement encompasses, yeah, a broad range of different tools that you have available to you in exerting sort of your influence over, over companies and assets. I could see why your platform are so powerful then with helping investors to understand what engagements, what are they doing and in a way measuring their own performance on the engagement or success or I don't know, effectiveness. I'm not sure the right word, but in a yeah, way it, seeing it, the correlation sort of at least. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, they, they need to do a better job of, of partly tracking and recording the kind of activities that they're doing, uh, also to improve the quality of their, their stakeholder reporting. So it's, it also goes into that same bucket of, of improving data management, improving the process overall, which hopefully leads to, to a more qualitative approach overall. And so that's sort of where we fit in them from a from a software and, and sort of technology perspective of enabling and empowering the investors. They still need to do the work, right? It's more that we, we sort of help them in the background in, in some ways. <laughs> I think sometimes it's confirming what your gut or your heart is feeling and having the data confirms what you think you're doing, uh, feel like you're doing, it will help confirm that. I'm also curious about any kind of um, regional trends or perspective you can share um, from either trends that you're seeing in the EU or more specifically in Scandinavia. I think it's always interesting to hear um, what's happening in different parts of the world. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, let's start with the US then as that's your home market. And, and you probably have sort of seen this over the years as well, Amanda, but US investors have been really focused a lot on, on the proxy voting process and focused a lot on proxy voting of course hedge fund activism is big in the u.s as well and we could also say that you know that the u.s has been sort of more focused on that sort of esg materiality lens in comparison to europe i would say um while in europe then you know there's been a sort of very long heritage within responsible investing it's been driven by certainly in the Netherlands and the Netherlands, but also in the Nordics and Sweden, together with some of the church funds and some of the national government pension plans and so forth, starting in the 90s. And sort of, it really was sprung out of that wish of, of being able to invest according to your values, right? We don't want to invest in corporates where, where there are confirmed breaches of international norms. We want to stay clear of the fossil fuel industry or, or the, the, the art weapons and arms industry and so forth. So that's sort of how it's thought. From that point forward, I would say that Europe has always had quite a, a prominent position, including the Nordics when it comes to responsible investment. And so if we then sort of zoom in on, on investment stewardship and ESG engagement, I think what we're seeing is increased expectations globally. Um, I mean, we've, we've had a, sort of an explosion of sustainable finance policy over the last decade or, or so. And it's not just policy, but it's also soft law or initiatives with stewardship codes and so forth that are really driving the expectations in the market for how investors should really, for example, then use their vo voice and rights to, to, to influence corporates. So that's really, yeah, setting a new bar in terms of how investors should work with this. It's not perfect, not at all. I mean, there are a lot of things that needs to be improved, but but certainly we're seeing a lot higher expectations today than what we saw even three or, or five years back. I think with, with the EU at least, um, helping to define what materiality means has given more clarity, direction to the, the organizations, the companies there, whereas in the US, there, at least um, our SEC hasn't come out with, yeah, we're still struggling to figure out, <laughs> to land on a common definition. And some of it will be done less through, I think, rules and policies and more through test cases and um, enforcement. Yeah. So it's definitely, we're monitoring and, and watching and learning as we go. Yeah, but I would say, you know, that, that that's not just for the US. I think there is currently, zooming in on investment stewardship, there is a lack of standardization as well um, globally, which is also creating confusion in the market. It's also being exploited to some extent. I mean, greenwashing it, like investment stewardship and, and the strategies utilized there 
has certainly not been exempt from claims of widespread greenwashing. So we're also seeing that sort of increased scrutiny, which is partly on the back of a lack of standardization, because it is hard to compare. It's hard to measure and understand how should we evaluate different managers on their active ownership work, aside from the vote and how they're voting, right? But more that qualitative aspect of engagement and, and how it should be valued and measured and reported on. That's still a area of confusion for many, and especially for, for sort of a retail audience, which which are trying to make sense of, you know, where should I put my savings and, and what kind of values do I have that I want to see exerted through through the, you know, the responsible investments and asset management of, of my money, right? I mean, it's, yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> it's, it is not easy, especially for an individual, the retail investor, as you mentioned, who, you know, this is where your savings is, you may not be an investment professional. And as you touched upon before, there's many different approaches towards um, responsible investing, everything from ESG integration to impact. So um, one is understanding that spectrum. And then number two, trying to search for the, let's say, mutual fund, as an example of what you're that that fits that approach. And then really, you know, does is that fund manager um, living up to what they're advertising? Are they, you know, delivering what they're advertising it's it's a tricky world and it's, it's i think um as these markets are and products are developing we're learning more and as you mentioned it's there's still a lot more to learn and a lot more maturity needed i'm glad that the, the discussion is happening the conversation is happening because the more we can reduce the confusion reduce the greenwashing it really brings clarity um to those for those investors right and kind of cuts out all the noise and that's what we need what needs let's start cutting out all the noise and really being able to focus on what yeah. solutions. Yeah, for sure. I think it's a lot around clarity, right? Like reducing the clutter, increasing the clarity. And we're also seeing that through some of the policy and the regulation coming out, which is really focused on disclosure, right? We need mm -hmm. to improve the level of disclosure, not just from investors, but also on, by corporates, right? So the corporates have a sort of, common baseline in terms of the kind of ESG or sustainability reporting that we should expect from, from different sectors, which then can feed up to, to sort of the investor level in terms of how they are analyzing these corporates and how that, that sort of feeds into their investment process and then also in, in their reporting back to their stakeholders. Clarity is, is certainly a, a key word here. <laughs> yes, I agree. Information is power and having that feedback loop, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Not only being able to report out, but getting feedback from your investors or whether you're an investor and you're reporting to your um, your investors, your um, um, your partners who you know provided the funds and having that feedback is so important to, to keep this advancing and progressing. Right. We've I think we've covered a lot in a short amount of time. So I want to first of all thank you for making this explaining these I think complex topics in a very easy way for us, and also sharing some perspectives from what you're seeing and from your um, from the platform and also from Europe as well. So thank you so much. Of course, thank you, Amanda. It was a pleasure. Thanks again to this month's sponsor, Big Pivot Partners. Learn more by visiting www.bigpivot.net.